Hello. All right, let me get set up here. Um, all right, I think I'm good to go. So welcome uh, to those of you who are here live. Welcome to those who are watching later. A um, couple housekeeping notes for today. Next week, next Monday, we are not meeting. It's Memorial Day. Uh, I am actually doing one of my monthly Q&As just for my general mailing list, which you could certainly participate in. I'm still going to do that uh, for Memorial Day, but that doesn't take as much preparation. So you're going to have two weeks until the next module. And I think that's good news because between the conversations I asked you to start last week and then the conversations uh, and work I'm going to give you tonight, it'll be nice to have two weeks to sort of work through some of that material and have some extra time to implement, I think. And again, you don't need to keep up necessarily, you know, and be right up with me every single week. You're going to have access to this for a long time. You, you've got to make this work for you. But it does help you, I think, to put in the time and energy while we're in the course together. Because when it comes to the uh, support circle, the office hours, um, you may have more to bring to that and be able to get more direct, you know, individual guidance about how to use this material in your own relationship. So while you don't have to keep up completely, I do advise doing your best to be working through the process so that you really can take advantage of my support. Uh, I think I said this before, you'll, you will have access to the next cohort of the class. I will include you in that. So you get another chance to sort of go through it and participate in that support circle. So it's not the last opportunity, but that'll be a while. That's not probably gonna be until the fall, just so you know. And I did uh, double check, check the dates. The first meeting of that support circle is actually Saturday, June 8th, not the first. So in five Saturdays in a row, 9 a.m. Pacific time, I'll be online in this sort of webinar format and available for questions. Uh, and you can submit them in advance. You can ask anonymously through the Q&A. You can raise your hand and actually talk to me through the webinar. A lot of different options. Uh, but that's when they're going to start is June 8th. So you'll be a fair amount of the way through this process. I think it's after the fourth mod. Uh, yeah, I think it's after the fourth mod that weekend, if I've got this right, um, that you're going to be able to, to come in and ask some questions and get guidance and, you know, and really individual input and feedback that might help you uh, overcome any obstacles that you're encountering in the process. All right, so let me load up uh, the screen share. I'm hopefully getting better at this now that I've done it a couple times. Okay, we're going to share the screen. We're going to start the slideshow. Okay, so today's topic um, is, okay, why isn't that clicking? There we go. It's all about communicating. Um, communicating in general to some degree, but communicating about sex specifically because that's what we're here working on, right? So we're going to go through a lot of material today. Uh, as always, it, there's so much to say about this stuff. I'll try to keep it concise. So the very first um, lesson in communicating is sort of just, honey, can we talk? How do you even introduce the conversation? Now, you guys in this course have at least introduced the conversation because you're participating in it, right? So it's not totally out of the blue, um, but still there may be, there are going to be elements of this that are going to be helpful to you as you progress through and talk about sex. And this is useful, you know, if you're talking about any more difficult conversations in your life, whether it's sex or not. So in this lesson, we're going to learn about why it can be so hard to talk about sex, how people avoid and deflect those conversations, and then how to approach this topic so that you can really deal with it as a team. So the first step to changing your sex life or anything else is by bringing it up. And actually, there's a pre-step, which is preparing that for that conversation, which we'll talk about in a minute. But this is the phase of this process where we're going to get really into talking about the elephant in the room, right, instead of skirting around it. Certainly, you're not, exa you're not really pretending it isn't there because you're in the course, um, but this is the module where we're going to really amp up our communication about it. So it is possible for you to change things just by changing yourself. You know, sometimes I have people ask to do individual therapy, even though their problems are couple oriented, that I don't generally like to do that. I think because it's much more effective if you're working together and you're having the communication, you're sharing the same set of assumptions and expectations. You've got the same sense of a goal and you're working together. But if you change your steps, the two of you cannot do the same dance. That is true but way more effective if you're doing this as a team. 
it's possible that the two of you can talk about all kinds of hard conversations, but not sex. Like this may be the one thing that really is a struggle for you, where you can talk about all the other, you know, different stuff. But it's also possible that sex is just one of the difficult topics that you struggle to address. That's not unusual to be able, you know, to really run into a hard time talking about things where you can't just agree to disagree, you know, where it gets loaded or you're heavily personally invested. So you're going to have a hard time talking about sex if you don't, I'm moving myself down here, if you don't um, know how to navigate these other disagreements in your life, right? You have to be able to have difficult conversations, you've got to be able to disagree, you really have to be able to tolerate anxiety and uncertainty. There's an unsettledness that you live in on your way to resolving something. And you really can't rush that or avoid that. So you've got to develop those skills, right? And if you or your partner are so afraid of hurting each other's feelings or you don't want to make each other uncomfortable, that really keeps you out of hard conversations, okay? That's, I understand the impulse um, to make each other feel good, but it really gets in the way of growth and change. Fighting can be a deflection from these conversations, right? So not just avoidance of them, but you can deflect. So one of you maybe brings up the tough topics, right? But you end up bickering, you know, either about that topic, you know, you get triggered and you're reactive to each other and it just sort of escalates. Um, you might accuse and blame or you beat yourself up, whatever, right? Um, that cycle of escalation and going around around that stuff means you never get anything resolved, right? You don't ever, you don't ever get to a, productive process to solve the problem. Um, and sex is, I, I don't even know how to put this in language, right? But it's so essential to who we are. It's like this primal core part of ourselves. It's, I, I mean, I, I don't even really want to use the word intimate, but it is, it's so personal and just so, um, I need some word for this, like special and, and guarded and sacred, <laughs> cherished, you know, and it's hard potentially to share that with someone else. If you really talk about sex and sexuality, you are open. You are exposed. You, you know, you're really letting yourself be seen. That's a tough thing to have a conversation about. You know, in couples counseling, we talk about the big four, which are sex, money, parenting, and in-laws. So it's right up there in one of the most difficult conversations you can try to have, right? So maybe you struggle with all four of those, maybe just a couple, but it's, a, you know, it's hard. Somebody needs to speak up first, right? One of you needs to be brave enough to bring up some of these topics. And again, it might be interesting to reflect on which one of you brought up the concern about your sex life that has led you into this course, right? Somebody, somebody took the lead on that. So when you're going to bring up a difficult conversation like sex, it helps to ground that in a vision and a hope for the best relationship you can have, right? You don't just start complaining you talk about how much the relationship means to you, how much you want it to thrive, how you know, committed you are to working together to solve this in a way that works for both of you, right? You come from a very positive place as opposed to where some people get in a very desperate, potentially blaming, emotionally escalated, dysregulated. You know, we, we maybe don't talk about stuff till it kind of like explodes or, or bleh, you know, comes out. If you can come from a really positive place, you know, don't just say that, feel that, get yourself in this positive place of I want our relationship to be really good. That's going to get you off on the right foot. It's best to start these conversations too, by revealing what's been going on for you. So think about, you know, how have you been feeling about your sex life? What are your contributions to the dynamic, to the problems that you think you're having? Where have you been avoiding sex and intimacy? How have you ignored or deflected your partner's attempts to deal with sex or, you know, whatever the other topic is, right? You can substitute any word in here for sex. So really take yourself on in this conversation way better than blaming. And then think ahead, you know, again, this is some of the groundwork you're doing before you go to your partner and say, I would like to talk. Think about what could be going on for your partner. Right? Don't just, you know, we get so absorbed in what's happening for us. What do you think your partner is thinking and feeling and wanting? What do you, what do you think they're afraid of? I can promise you, you guys have fears, right? Can you imagine what they might be afraid of? How can their behavior make sense? As opposed to, you know, sometimes it seems really baffling, but there's an explanation. Can you start to piece that together, at least have a hypothesis? 
And can you see their behavior um, in the best possible light, right? So really try, you're trying to sort of like pre-empathize with your partner before you go into the conversation. The more you can lead with your own self-confrontation, the better it's gonna go, okay? Now, on the other hand, you don't want to go in there and lay yourself all out on the table and then your partner goes, yeah, Leah, look at you. <laughs> it's not fair to just um, not participate. You know, each of you needs to come to the table looking at your own part. You're responsible for your own part of the equation. It's always an equation. There's something on each side. Every situation is co-created. Okay. So lesson two are some very specific communication tools that um, apply to everything, not just sex, okay? These are just really core um, ideas and practices you can put into place that are going to make communication more productive. Uh, there may be some tough feelings. I'm not saying you're not gonna have emotion or that this isn't gonna be hard, but these are the tools that I think are gonna move you through things to a solution, maybe not in one conversation, but over time rather than the ways we tend to get stuck. So we're gonna learn communication tools that make a difference, why it's so important to separate your thoughts from your feelings, how to recognize and deal with a miscommunication. So lot, there are several strategies that I have, I mean, they're not mine, I didn't make these up, but the, the way I talk about them uh, has developed or evolved over time in my work with clients, right? So there are certain kind of core strategies that I teach people on a really regular basis that I think if you can, you know, they take practice, but if you can get better and better at these, it's gonna really improve your communication. So as, just hold in your mind, as we are talking about your sex life, disappointing, stressful, avoidant, whatever it is, remember that at least one of you feels sad and probably believes that you are broken or inadequate. Maybe both of you. Maybe it's you that's watching this, maybe it's your partner. Something hasn't been going well. People feel really bad and broken about that. And avoidance is a strategy. It's developed as a way to deal with it. Now, it doesn't help, but it's, I want you to have some compassion for each other in this, okay? This is stuff is hard. It's natural to struggle and avoid and even fight. Um, what we're trying to do is cre you know, create a little bit of gre grace and compassion and room for you guys to approach these topics. So, my first sort of rule is it's your job to share what's on your mind. Okay. So you should reveal what's going on in your head. It's not your job to read each other's mind. Okay. It's not your job to notice that your partner's upset or to drag stuff out of them. It is not their job to do that for you. So if you have something going on, a concern, a complaint, a worry, or, you know, positive, you should bring it up with your partner. Okay. And it's also your job to correct your partner if they're misreading you. So if they act like or, or talk like um, they have some assumption about what's going on for you and it isn't on the mark, it's your job to correct that, to actively use words and correct that. So this is different than a lot of people operate, okay? A lot of people expect their partner to speak up when they notice that they're sad or annoyed. It's like up to, you've got to ask me about why I'm so sad. That demonstrates your lack of caring or that you're attuned to me, or I struggle to take up that kind of space so I depend on you to kind of do that work. That's how a lot of relationships operate, but that is not the most productive. So rather than expect them to read you and pursue you, share it directly, okay? Now, not 100% of the time, nobody's perfect, there's room to inquire about each other, right? But the majority of the time, it's on each of you to bring up what's going on for you. Okay. Um, somewhat related to this is this idea of lay your cards down first. Play your hand. Okay. So there's a common tactic people do where they ask a question of the other person rather than just stating uh, what they're thinking or wanting. So even where do you want to go to dinner tonight? And then your partner says, well, I want to go to pizza. Oh, no, I didn't want pizza. I want a Thai food. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's a trap. Like, you know, there's a right answer. And, um, or sometimes we don't want to reveal what's going on for us about this unless we know our partner's going to go there first, right? Like, how are you feeling about our sex life? You know, that sort of indicates you've got some thoughts about it, right? But you're not, you, don't want to, you don't want to play that until you know 
what your partner says and what kind of um, table do they set for that conversation, right? None of that is very helpful. Okay, you can trap your partner or you can avoid um, being, you know, intimately revealing what's happening for you. Okay, you can hide behind the question and then sort of play from there. So that is not a productive strategy. So my rule of the court is you play your cards first, okay? You talk about what you think or want or feel or whatever, you know, your request or what you, whatever it is, and then you ask your partner what they think or how it is. You're willing to, to speak up without knowing if you're going to get approval or not, right? You don't know exactly how this is going to be received, but it's a much stronger position to just sort of say, okay, here's me. What about you? Right? No hiding. Empathize first and then respond. This is crucial, okay? So if somebody is sharing something, remember we talked about uh, it's your job to bring something up, right? So whoever starts that, whoever's sharing a complaint or whatever, the other person's job is to empathize first. So you hear what they're saying and you make it clear that you understand it, okay? You're taking the time to hear and listen and really, it's like you're really trying to see it out of their eyes. You're not constructing your response, you're not debating, you're not defending, you're not explaining, okay? And it's not like you, I mean, there are some um, communication strategies where you paraphrase it back and, you know, there's some sometimes more formal structures that people use. It doesn't have to be elaborate. But what I want you to do, so if somebody is sharing with you, I don't want you to stop until you really can see it through their eyes. If this is what happened, I can see why you would feel it that, feel like it you know, that way. And if you, if you really can't do that, if you cannot empathize with this, this just baffles you. You can at least say, I want to understand you. I am trying, I just can't wrap my mind around it, but I want to. Okay. That goes a long way. But basically you want to empathize first and you want to close that loop. You want to ask your partner, is there anything I haven't understood? Is there more you want to say about that? Because sometimes people uncover more thoughts, you know, as they go. So is there anything else you think it's important for me to understand? Once they to you know, totally let you know that they have been understood and that you've, you've gotten their point of view, then you can explain or talk about your side or you can um, certainly you can acknowledge and apologize if you've done something wrong. This empathy, I can't say this enough, does not mean that you agree with them. I think this is what stops a lot of people from doing it, okay? It doesn't mean that you agree. You're just saying, wow, if I was in your position, seeing the way you're describing what happened, that this is what you saw, and this is what, how the meaning you made of it, and da 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 that all makes sense. Doesn't mean that's what happened, or I would feel the same way, okay? This is crucial. Doesn't mean you agree, but I want you to be able to understand it from their perspective. And then this goes both ways. You each get a turn. You have to do this for each other, okay? So then you, once you, the first person has been understood, then you can talk about, wow, well, for me, this is what happened, right? This is how I saw it, and I responded, and this was what I was trying to do. Um, and this is where you can acknowledge, or you should acknowledge, your contributions, or things that you wish you had done differently, or things you just blew, right? Mistakes. This is where you can own that stuff and apologize for the things you actually regret, okay? Doesn't mean it always results in an apology. You may not have done anything wrong. People can have their feelings hurt or be angry. Doesn't mean you did something wrong. Uh, but if you did, take some ownership of that, okay? So this empathize first and then respond is really, really helpful in your relationship. It's gonna be helpful with your children. It's gonna be helpful in all kinds of situations. Uh, so the next concept, all of these kind of tied together, is, is addressing the interpersonal gap. Now, that's a con that was a concept developed, I think, in the 60s or 70s by John Wallen. And the way, uh, what it describes is the difference between what somebody intends when they say something and the impact on the person that heard it. There's a gap there. I say one thing with a certain intent, but it hits you differently, and you have a different impact. Uh, it's almost like you get a different message, literally, right? So one of you says something, you mean a certain thing, you're trying to communicate it to your partner. Of course, we're limited by words, right? So it's affected, the, that message is affected by the language you use, you know, the actual words, your, your worldview, your sort of filter, um, you know, that has an effect on your ability 
to clearly communicate what you're trying to communicate, okay? Then it's impacted by the medium, right? The, the air, the sound, if you're trying to write, if it's a bad phone connection, right? Like it's gotta go through something. Now, if you're right next to each other, that's not such a big deal. Then that message goes through the filter of the receiver. We all have a worldview. We have things we attend to that we expect to hear. We've got certain ways things get kind of shaped on their way in, uh, largely related to sort of our baggage and our experiences, right? So, but that can kind of distort that message, uh, and then it hits you with an impact. So, if you think about it, that's a long journey of a message, where a lot of things can change. Basically, this is how a misunderstanding happens. Okay, so if you have been triggered in a conversation. You know what that means, right? You're having this sort of strong emotional response to something. You know how much your filter, what I call your filter, right? These past experiences can affect communication, right? We've got these sensitive spots uh, based on our own past experiences, largely, um, that mean things hit those buttons. It's not because our partner's trying to necessarily, probably not, but maybe. But anyway, that just happens, right? We have this filter. We have this way of receiving that has a huge impact on how we hear these messages. So the difference between your intent as the speaker and the impact on the receiver is this interpersonal gap. So to address it, you have to take apart what happened, right? So first of all, the, the biggest clue that you're in one of these gaps is that your partner responds differently than you would expect, right? It seems out of proportion or, or they're angry when you didn't think it was a big deal, right? You get surprised, it's like, whoa, that tells you right away something has happened to that message, right? Instant clue. So, or if you if you don't even have a really strong reaction, right? You receive a message and you realize, uh, sort of call it a pinch, right? Ooh, you know, there's almost like a, a reaction. That's a sense that something has hit you and you might want to clarify, is there a gap? Is that what you meant? You know, because the way I heard that, this was the impact on me. You want to slow it way down and go through the message get clearer and clearer about what the person intended and get clearer and clearer about what the impact actually was and how you heard that. And you start to figure out, okay, what went wrong? Why did this, why was there a mismatch? And what do we learn about each other in that process? It can be an incredibly um, intimate thing to work through these misunderstandings and really understand more about each other. If you can sort of step out, slow down and look at it kind of from the outside. Okay. And it's important, you want to be giving each other the benefit of doubt in this. You know, don't assume you're trying to hurt each other, whether they meant this thing that, that hurt you. You know, really slow it down and see what the actual intent was. All right, now we're at one of my favorite topics, differentiating between thoughts and feelings. I mean, I, I still do this wrong all the time. I'm really trying to police my own language, but this is difficult. Okay, but it is so important to be clear about what is a thought and what is a feeling. Okay, this will really change your conversations. So you've got to think about when you're talking about something, there's what happened, which you may have two very different uh, memories of and views of, and that's okay. Memory is a, is a notably unreliable source. Uh, you probably, neither one of you remember it perfectly. I don't know if you know this, but like eyewitness testimony is incredibly unreliable. So we all think we know exactly what happened, but it didn't. But anyway, you've at least got your idea of what happened, which are like the facts. It's what a video camera would show, right? No meaning attached to that, just action. You have the thoughts that you had about it. This is the meaning you gave to what happened, that you attributed to it. Okay, there's a story. There's a, the thoughts that drove your action or the thoughts that you had in response to action. Then there's how you feel about it, which is only emotions, okay? And then there's what you want which would be your request. So I gotta get the example I use is I feel like you don't value the contribution I make to this family. Okay. That is not a feeling statement. I feel like you abandoned me. I feel like you never listen. None of those are feelings. Okay. Feelings very basically fall into four categories, sad, mad, glad, and afraid. Now you can get more nuanced than that, but they basically cluster there. They have to be, emotions. This is really difficult to correct. Okay. So you, in this case, you feel sad and resentful, but it's you think your partner does not appreciate you and you think they don't value what you do. What this does is it diffuses tension because 
you have feelings. Those are valid. Those are emotions. Those are chemical, basically, right? That's going on. That's really real. The thoughts we have added. The thoughts may or may not be accurate. The thoughts are not absolute, okay? So all of a sudden, the thoughts can be held out here and examined for accuracy. The thoughts are having are generating real emotions in you for sure, right? But the thoughts are just thoughts. This is so important. So use I language. You've probably heard this phrase before, but basically you talk about yourself, your own experience, your reaction to it without it being you, 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 you. You don't make it about the other person. So you're not labeling or judging your partner. You are not attached to the idea that what you think and feel is right. Your feelings are valid, again, right? Because you're having them, those are just emotions, but it doesn't mean the thoughts that go along with them are accurate, okay? So you recognize and own that your experience is yours, that you are having feelings, that you are making meaning out of what's happening, and it keeps the conversation in the realm of that discovery, the curiosity about what's what you're reacting to and what your experience is. It's not about you, 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 you. It just makes another big difference. So back to the example, right? Feeling like my partner doesn't contribute, uh, doesn't value my contributions to the family. So you might say, I realize I feel sad and resentful about how much I think I do for the family. I have the story that you don't even notice all my effort or that you don't care or value the ways I contribute. This belief keeps me distant from you. And I can tell it's really in the way of our relationship. You know, will you explore with me what I'm thinking and feeling so we can move it out of the way? So I know it's hard to speak so calmly when you're upset, but you can get better at this. That was all about if this was me. me. I recognize my feelings. I have all these thoughts that I can own or just thoughts, beliefs, and stories, and meaning, right, uh, that may or may not be right. It, it's in on my way with you. And I, can we work on this together? Can we figure out what's actually happening? Confront yourself first. Okay, so you start by, just like we were prepping for the conversation about sex, by examining what you really think and feel and how you might contribute to something, right? You start by facing yourself. You admit your negative parts. You acknowledge your contributions, the role of your negative parts in what's happening. If you feel stingy or greedy or jealous or whatever, you can say that out loud. You, you, know, you own it. This demonstrates that you're willing to admit your faults and it sets a stage for your partner to do the same thing, right? It, this, really, this work really is about self-confrontation for each of you. So again, we're back to the example, right? Now that we're talking about it, I know I have a part of me that is a martyr. I do a lot around the house that you don't even expect. I take on more than I can handle. I struggle to ask for help. And sometimes I don't even tell you I've done something. I'm waiting for you to notice. And then I end up getting resentful when you don't. I've been too afraid to bring it up and address it, and that's on me, okay? Going forward, I am not going to secretly pick up the slack, and I'm gonna to talk to you to work out a more equi equitable way to share what we're doing around the house, okay? A lot of ownership about my role and how much part I play in this. And again, this just diffuses so much tension and really allows you guys to work as allies. Make a request, but you gotta remain flexible, okay? So, General rule is to ask for what you want, but you can't expect that you're gonna get it, okay? It's really important that you advocate for yourself and for your desires, but you are dealing with another person who has also their own desires, right? Um, so there are two actual people here, <laughs> so there needs to be room for them too, okay? And you're, you, sometimes things are mutually exclusive, sometimes things require a compromise or a collaboration. Just because you gather the courage to ask for something does not mean you're going to get it. Okay, so you got to remain flexible. So you advocate, but you also have to collaborate. And then, you know, anticipate pushback. I mean, you guys are in this course together. Hopefully, it's working well as a team and together. But as you are navigating into difficult territory, um, there can be defensiveness, there can be resistance, there can be, I mean, driven by fear largely. Right? There's some pressure in the sort of system to maintain the status quo, right? It takes energy and effort to get over the hump of change. So keeping things on the table, bringing it up over time is going to be more important than bringing it up in the first place, okay? You are going to have to show that you're serious about this. You're not going to sweep it back under the rug. 
this is something that's going to, you know, you're, you're not hounding somebody, hammering them, but you're going to be somewhat persistent and, and like, no, we need to address this. If you change that, if, you, if, if your partner sees that you're not going to just drop this again for another six months, they, they're going to recognize that, right? And it's going to be harder and harder to resist or refuse. So it's going to take um, some resilience on your part, on each of your parts in different ways, I'm sure, uh, to continue to just move forward with this and don't just drop it. Okay, so those were the, the overall communication tips for you. Okay, there's a lot there, I know. Um, this next section I call who packed your bag. So when we think about we have baggage, I can't remember what's on the next slide. Okay, right, we're gonna learn how complicated your family history can be and how those experiences relate to what you're experiencing now. Okay, so this is the discovery part of this process of sex without stress. All these conversations that I'm gonna have you have <laughs> are about unearthing and recognizing how the past is influencing today, how the way you're stuck now relates to things that make sense and have happened to you. None of this is happening in a vacuum. It's not arbitrary that you have the struggles that you have, okay? So I already asked you last week to start some of these, what we call family of origin, the family history conversations. As you were um, thinking about your expectations about sex and how you were shaped growing up, I'm gonna just cover in a little bit more detail the various categories of things I want you to continue talking about. I mean, you would have seen them in the questions, but uh, I want to talk about how, their importance, I guess, because I'm sure lots of you haven't finished that, right? There's more to go through. So the goal of this is to focus on yourself, your individual contribution to the cycle, right? So you're going to be prepared to change your part. So you're looking at your own personal history, your own baggage. Like we, you know, we say, oh, we all bring baggage into a relationship. This is what we're talking about. Who packed those bags? What went in there? Where did it come from? And how is it influencing you now? So every situation is co-created. Like I said, your sex life is not an exception to that. You're each gonna have things that kind of fit together uh, that make sense. And you're only, you only care about your side of this, okay? Don't worry about what your partner's doing. Just look at what has shaped you. So part of the difficulty in dealing with a sex life, you know, one of these, um, these hard topics is because often we have come into adulthood, into our relationship with a pattern of how we deal with difficult things that has not served us that well. Okay, so your contributions to the cycle, like I said, is not a coincidence. It's not arbitrary. The way you're interacting now, the way you're stuck is going to relate to the past. It's going to make sense. You have these challenges for a reason. And probably they show up in more than just your sex life. So we start with your, what's called your family of origin. Okay. That's the uh, psychological term for it. So this are the people that you grew up with, right? Your family, your mom, dad, siblings, you know, grandparents or step parents, whoever was sort of in your household and your immediate family when you were a kid. That's how a lot of our personality and expectations develop. Um, other things influence it, which we're going to also get to, but, um, a lot of it happens in the family. So I have asked you uh, to think about a lot of these questions already. Okay, you started that in the last module, but we're gonna go a little bit deeper into the different segments of that now. So you may want to journal uh, some of these responses as you're going through this stuff, as you're reflecting. You know, If you're having them as conversations, you might wanna uh, journal afterward. Maybe you want to journal and reflect first and then have the conversations, you know, however you want to tailor this, but it might be helpful to write some of this stuff down, at least the ahas, the takeaways that you get. You don't have to write a whole long life story. That would be a lot of work. But at least the things that are like click for you, like, oh, this relates to how we're stuck now or even how we're successful now. It's not like it's all negative, okay? Um, take as much time as you need with these conversations. You do not have to go question by question by question. I mean, the prompts are there because I think they're useful, but do the ones that resonate for you, come up with new ones, you know, follow the conversation where it goes. The whole point of this is to understand your background and how it's impacted you and to understand that about your partner as well, right? You can, you learn more about each other. So again, we're starting with your family of origin. So power in your family. Okay. So every family has a way uh, of deciding who's in charge, who's in control of very aspect, various aspects of your family life. Power is in your family. 
So there's automatically a power difference between adults and children. Um, but sometimes that gets, I want to say warped, but that's kind of a negative word. Sometimes kids have way too much power and sometimes uh, they have like none, right? It's not a healthy balance. So, um, and power sometimes is super, uh, what's the word I want? Like overt, you know, you got an authoritarian parent or a lot of strict rules or even, um, you know, spanking or, or physical abuse, something like that. Power can be much more subtle. It can be about manipulation and looking like the one down person, but actually having the power, you know. So think about the questions in this segment, ask you to think about the power between the parents in your household, between the children in your household, between the parents and the children. Like there's a lot to sort of take apart in terms of what you learned about power. Love and support. If you think about um, families are very different in terms of how much or even if they show love and affection and support to each other, right? So some of you have been raised to feel a ton of love and support, right? Others may have known from the very beginning you were on your own, or you may literally have been on your own, right? So that uh, environment shapes your attachment style and really shapes your expectations and relationships, what kind of support you're able to give and what you expect to get. Right, so your experiences with touch, with support, with reliability have direct relationship um, to your adult relationships. Sex, right? We, obviously, we're going to talk about how sex <laughs> uh, was dealt with in your family. You know, your the attitude towards sex, the lessons about sex, the teachings, and the nonverbal communication about it. Some of you will have come from very open families. They talked about it; it was seen as healthy. Some of you got like nothing, like silence. It was taboo. And some of you got maybe just overtly negative teaching about sex. This is sinful, shameful, uh, it's dangerous, you, should, you know, don't do it. Um, it's worth taking apart how this was uh, communicated and trained in you as you grew up. Conflict, of course, how your family dealt with conflict or not has a huge impact on your ability to deal with it now, right? To deal with these tough topics, to deal with disagreements about it, okay? So sometimes people came from homes where keeping the peace was the most important thing. Um, so you don't rock the boat, you know, we just don't talk about this stuff, right? Sometimes people came from super chaotic conflict where parents are screaming or fighting or this all this um, direct uh, conflict and chaos, sometimes even a threatening way. Maybe there's been domestic violence or something like that. Sometimes it was something in between, you know, there was some conflict, but you didn't really ever know how it got resolved. You didn't learn uh, how to actually deal with it in a way that people um, came together and understood each other, right? So how your family trained you to deal with conflict, I'm sure is related to what you're doing now. Now, I should say, you know, sometimes we, we have done work and we have grown from what we, what's packed in our, I guess what I'd say at that point, we've taken some of the stuff out of our bags. It's, it's possible something that's in your bags that you've already taken out. But to the degree that you haven't, that's what we're talking about. Substance abuse and mental illness, I kind of put these together because these are huge. Sometimes silent impacts uh, in your family, right? So it's a big deal if somebody in your family uh, was an alcoholic or a drug addict, okay? It's a big deal if you had a parent who was really depressed or psychotic, right? Or schizophrenic or narcissistic. Like the, these, these issues aren't always talked about you know, but they, they structure the family, okay? So there's the phenomenon itself of the disease or the mental illness or the substance abuse, but then there's how the family dealt with it. You know, was it talked about? Was it overt? Was it, you know, did everybody dance around this thing? Everybody ignore it? Uh, was it the kind of thing that nobody in public knew this happened, right? There's a lot to sort of uncover with how your family dealt with that and what that means for you now in terms of dealing with things directly. Secrets, so, you know, secrets can be about any of the stuff that we've already talked about, but how did your family deal with secrets? Were you expected to keep them? Did you? Did they keep secrets from you? Uh, was there, a, you know, a wink, wink, we, this isn't actually happening kind of thing? Were you manipulated with secrets? Were you supposed to keep secrets from one parent for the other? Did this put you in the middle, right? There's a lot you can take apart with uh, secrecy in your family. So, no matter how you were raised or what the home you were raised in was like, you got messages about how you're supposed to behave and what's expected of you, right? And what you learn 
is not the same as anyone else. Literally, they say no two siblings have the same parents, even twins. You get treated differently, right? They're at a different stage, of, well, twins aren't, but other siblings are at a different stage of life. I mean, everything is unique. So you learn what gets you praised, what gets you punished, what gets you left alone, okay? This has a big impact on you. So if you have never examined this, it can be really hard to see it. It's like, you know, I call it the water we swim in. Really hard to see it. So, you know, we, we tend to think, well, this is what everybody was like, or of course this is how you do it, but that's not true. Families are very, very different. So you have to come to understand that you have some choice about these things that you learned. So nothing absolute about how things need to be. You get to make choice. The patterns that you have were adaptations to your environment. I mean, it served you, right? You were trained, you survived till now, but you don't have to keep everything that was packed for you in your baggage. All right, last, I think this is the last lesson. I'm sorry, these are so long, but I'm trying to get you through this. Um, your sex and relationship history is also important. So you've got your family of origin, but then you've got your sexual development and your past relationships. So we're gonna talk about these things and how it sheds light on your current struggles. Okay, so once you have examined your family of origin, I would get that done first, then we're gonna look back at your relationship history and your sexual history, okay? Because those also put things in your baggage. So there, again, are a lot of conversations to have about this that I want you um, to take your time. Same thing, you don't have to do every single question, you don't have to go in order, take your time, do this in a way that works for you, break it up if you need to break it up, take breaks if something is triggering, but I do ask that you just keep coming back because these are important insights to have about yourself and about the other. So in terms of sexual history, you're gonna think first about back to sex itself, the messages you got about it from your family, culture, religion, community. You know, we talked a little bit about that around the expectations things, but there are more questions about about sex itself in your history to go over. Then we've got your sexual identity. Okay, this is your sense of yourself as a sexual person that develops over time. So this is about sexual orientation, which is who you're attracted to, your gender that you relate with, your gender identity. Um, it can be whether you feel kinky or not, right? Sexual preferences, it's all of this together about your sexuality, how that's, um, grown and changed over time and what your journey has been around figuring that out or being aware of it. Then there are questions about your early sexual experiences, right? So your past experiences affect your expectations and basically what you think is possible for yourself. So you may have rebelled against some of the things that happened to you and totally changed it. You may be repeating that. Um, no matter what, they've, they've influenced you. Right? So to go back through your earlier sexual experiences from when you were first maybe even masturbating to uh, other experiences, there's going to be a lot to learn. Okay? Then there's sexual trauma. So I'm aware in any group that a proportion of you have had sexual trauma in your past. Okay? Whether this was um, traumatic, directly traumatic, whether it was coercive, whether it was confusing, whether it just seems sort of inappropriate, whether you don't know how you feel about it, whether this is a capital T or a small t, it's a common thing, okay? It has often an effect on our sex life, sometimes profound. Not always. I don't want to make it sound like that. It's not sweeping, but it may have. So if you have had trauma or if your partner has had trauma, I want you to go especially slowly through these sections and I want you to be very aware of whether you need additional support, okay? Especially take breaks if you need it. You, if you have never dealt with the trauma that you've had, you might wanna consider seeing a therapist about that. Um, but I just, I caution you to do this carefully and in a way that works for you, okay? I don't want this to be re-traumatizing. Don't want you to go over the details. I mean, unless you want to, unless that feels cathartic or important, I don't want you to dwell in the past trauma but I want you to have enough of an understanding of it and especially how it's affecting you now that it can be useful. So there are plenty of therapists that specialize in working with trauma. There are some resources available. Um, you know, if you're really reactive and triggered in sex, if you dissociate during sex, if you're getting upset in these conversations, that's where I really want you to seek out that extra support. So tread gently, 
and take care of yourself, right, if this material is triggering to you or to your partner. Okay, then we're going to talk about um, previous relationships. So it's important to look back if you've had them, um, the patterns that show up uh, and what you've learned about what you can expect. So when I see couples in, in counseling, of course, we have all these conversations, right? There's a thorough, I mean, not necessarily in order like this, but, you know, we're talking about all these past experiences that inform today and shed some light on why a couple is struggling right now with their sex life. So it's a lot to hand you to have these conversations, I know, to, to dig through this and look yourself and reflect, and that's where I think the journaling really could help, okay? Um, I'm going to talk about two different exercises real quick, we're almost done, that I have on the sort of homework, the action items this week, but I wanna go over them a little bit because it, it might be easier than just sort of reading instructions or something. Okay, so the first one is an eye gazing exercise. Now, I asked you last week to do something new, one new thing for you in terms of physical interaction. This week, we're gonna add this, okay? So eye gazing, uh, you sit in two chairs or cross-legged if you're more flexible than I am, something like that, and you're facing each other, okay? Um, I think you can see my hands down in the corner, right? And you adjust your distance so you can focus, right? You're not totally blurred out or anything, and you sit and you just, hold each other's gaze, all right? And you are looking at your partner's left eye, which is to your right. So you don't have to go back and forth or that way. You know, you're just sort of holding the eye that is on your right to each other. And you just let yourself be. There's nothing more than that, okay? You're not, you don't mask yourself. Nothing is supposed to happen. You just notice. How does your body feel? What comes up? You, know, you may have to look away. You may laugh. All that's fine. No judgment. You just be in the experience. Okay, it's, a, it's revealing. You just sit and be seen and see, okay? Once you have a little bit of comfort with that, um, and there's not like a strict time limit, but you know, maybe you're aiming for like three to five minutes, which is a pretty long time, right? Once you have some comfort with that, then you work on synchronizing your breathing. So at first you each breathe out at the same time and breathe in at the same time, right? Out and in. And what this does is first of all, it brings you way into your body to breathe and you have that awareness of each other because you have to synchronize and then once you're synchronized for a while then you get an alternate breathing one of you breathes out and one breathes in it's almost like you're passing the breath back and forth okay so that's alternate breathing and again you have the same experience of awareness of each other and of being in your body and just being in the moment and again whatever happens no shoulds here no problem you just are you just are okay that's the eye gazing exercise the other exercise that I literally just learned yesterday when I was in Ann Arbor <laughs> at a CEU training, um, but I was so excited about this, I wanted to bring this back for you. So this is called a self-anchored satisfaction scale. Okay, so what first I'm going to tell you what you do is you each fill this out separately. Go away from each other, take your time, and you do this independently. Okay, after you have both done it, then you reflect using the questions, the reflection questions, again, separately. So you take your scale, you go through the questions, you mull this over, you reflect, you journal. Only after that do you come together and discuss and see what this reveals between the two of you. Okay, so you're gonna see more in the questions about what's, how this is gonna be so useful. But I just wanna show you quickly, actually, I'm gonna do it once I take the screen share off because then you'll be able to see it, it bigger. I'll show you the actual form because I wanna just show you how that works. Um, so that's the self-anchored satisfaction scale. So your action items this week, answer the journal questions, which again, all this stuff is up on the um, members page, okay? Do the self-anchored satisfaction scale exercise. Go through the family, sexual, and relationship history conversations. You can read aloud from a good sex book if talking about sex is difficult at all. I love the guide to getting it on, but there are other ones and then add the eye gazing breathing exercise. Okay, I know that's a lot, you, you know, remember you've got two weeks and you don't even have to be done then, but pace yourself, try to schedule in some time to get to this stuff so that you're really building up some momentum to it, okay? Those are the action items. And then in the next lesson, this is where I, my favorite one may be all about sexual desire. So we're gonna learn about desire discrepancy, it's totally normal. We're gonna learn how to cultivate desire even if you don't spontaneously feel it. And then we're going to learn about how flexibility in your sexual encounters takes the pressure off and opens you up for desire. 
Okay, it's a, I love that module. So in two weeks, that's what we're doing. Okay, so let me unshare. All right, so now I just want to show you really quick this form. Um, okay, this is, I don't know if it's backwards. Anyway, it's a scale without any labels. So if you, you may have seen Likert scales that say, oh, not satisfied, kind of satisfied, really satisfied. This is totally blank. There's 10 little marks, totally blank. You decide what's on the low, what does the low end of sexual satisfaction mean to you? What does the middle mean to you? What does the high end mean to you? So their example, which I did include on the forms, is how about, how, how do you feel about ice cream? Right, and you'd make a mark and you would describe, you know, the low end of the scale is, oh, I don't like it at all, it's weird, it, you know, it makes me, I've got, I'm lactose intolerant, right? The middle end might be, yeah, it's okay, I kind of like ice cream, you know, lukewarm. And, this, and the top of the scale is, I just love this, I get eat it all the time, it's all I ever want, right? So that just gives you an example and you would mark where you fall on the scale for ice cream for you. Okay, where this is gonna get interesting is you do this for sexual satisfaction. So there's a blank scale. Again, you get the same blank, 10 marked thing, okay? I want you to mark how satisfied are you in your sex life at the moment. And I want you, it says this on the form too, but you are going to write all the description and words you can that describes what does a low end of sexual satisfaction mean to you? What does that look like? Is that not having sex at all? Is that pain? Or, you know, whatever it is, all the things that would describe what would put sexual satisfaction on the low end of the scale for you? What would put it in the middle? And then what would put it at the high end? How would you describe what would be going on for sex to be at the high end of sexual satisfaction for you? Highly individual, that's why it's called self-anchored. So you describe these things, and then you mark where on the scale your level of sexual satisfaction is now. Basically at this point in time, not like today, this moment, but you know, in this period of time. So you do that scale, take some time with it, fill it out as much as you can, put as much thought into that as you can, then use the reflection questions about it, and then come together and have a conversation about what that reveals, okay? I think that I'm gonna start using this with people all the time. So it, and when you see the questions, you'll understand exactly how much you might get out of it. All right, so that's the presentation for today. I am gonna quickly uh, open up the Q&A in the chat and just see if there are questions from anybody that's here live. Again. This isn't really the place to get personal guidance in the process, but if you have questions about this material or the logistics of this, this is where you can ask. So let me just open that up. Don't see anything. Look at the chat. Don't see anything either. I'll give it just a minute before I close out. I don't ever get to see dot, dot, dots with this one, so I never know if anybody's typing. And again, June 8th, we're back for the actual um, support circle, which is the office hours where you, you can totally have a back and forth and make it very specific to your situation and potentially your obstacles that you're hitting or at least uh, help you springboard your success because that is what I want. All right, I don't see any questions, so I'm going to close that up and uh, I will not see you in next week. I will see you in two weeks, Monday the, oh gosh, I don't know what the date is. One, but anyway, in two weeks, <laughs> I'll see you. I'll see you then. Yeah, I guess that's in June. So have a good afternoon.